What's up, people? Welcome to our live stream. Today, we're going to be talking about do artists need an art agent? And if you would like to learn how to turn your artistic weakness into your strength, check out artprop.org where we have lots of free resources, tutorials, critiques, art dares, pro development, and all that cool stuff. So why don't you get us started, Clara? Yeah, the first question to ask yourself is, do I even need an agent? talk to a lot of artists and they say, oh, I need to get one. And then I talk to them and I realize, no, you don't need one. You have to figure it out though. And it's not that clear cut. So Kat, I know that you have a literary agent. How did you figure out if you need one or not? Well, it got to the point where I realized I couldn't navigate the world of publishing without a seasoned professional because I was new on the scene, I was gonna debut, but I didn't wanna get taken advantage of. And the whole point of an agent is not only to represent you, but to protect you in these situations that they know how to navigate. Agents have a certain amount of savvy in the field that is really hard to get on your own. It takes a long time to know what works and what doesn't. Jordan, I know you have an agent has your agent protected you or given you information that you didn't know on your own? Yeah. So I mean, one, one thing that's super important is just like going through contracts and seeing like what um, certain businesses will say, because they're, they're throwing a lot of stuff that a lot of artists usually don't understand. Um, but they'll say things like, oh, you cannot produce your own artwork and post it. Otherwise, we own a portion of that or um, because you're signing another contract with them. And all these other little loophole things, they will be able to spot those very easily. Tell us in the chat, who here has thought about getting an agent? Who here is trying to get an agent actively right now? And who here has an agent? Because there's so many different experiences, relationships that are out there. Kat, I think the contract part is super important. What was your experience with that in your agent? Because you do have a book deal. The contract part is super important. And I was so glad that I had an agent to walk me through it. Because of course, I can read through the contract and see if something is enormously wrong. But my agent really knows the nuances of the publishing industry. For instance, I wonder if I can say some specific things or if I would get in trouble for them. But <laughs> basically, my original contract stipulated something that was not industry standard. But it would have been standard for a newbie, a newbie who didn't have an agent to protect them. But my agent spotted that and was like, that's wrong. We got to change that. It's not necessarily illegal, but it's wrong. <laughs> Lisa's asking, won't an agent tend to tell you to hire a lawyer to read contracts. If you have an agent, they'll do that for you. Right, Jordan? Yeah, that, that's their whole purpose. Like like Kat said earlier, their whole purpose is to protect you. So they are well versed in reading contracts because if they're a quality agent, they'll have had they'll have uh, other clients and they'll have represented other people who have gone through uh, very intense situations, like maybe they have a book deal, maybe they're having their own show or their own film produced, and they will know exactly what to look for. So I'm not saying a lawyer isn't necessary, but they should be well-versed enough to be able to guide you. And another thing to keep in mind is if you're in my situation, I don't have an agent, but the thing is I have had contracts that I needed to be read and in that situation, I did hire a lawyer, Greg Kanan, who a lot of you have seen here on the stream before. But the thing about an agent is that you don't have to pay them extra to read the contract because cat agents don't make money until you actually have a book deal. Right. And that's actually a really important point. If you're looking for an agent, do not go for an agent that asks you to pay a fee up front. <laughs> an agent should get a percentage of what you earn later. So it's a serious business partnership. Be careful who you choose. Now, I recently had an experience with, do I need an agent? I was so sure that I did because I need to get my travel art show onto Netflix. <laughs> but the thing is, I know nothing about that process, that industry. And so I assume, oh my gosh, I'm going to need an agent. There's no way I can figure this out by myself. And so I talked to Greg Kanan, my lawyer, and he's so interesting because he went to art school and he used to be a producer 
and he produced shows on the Discovery Channel, all kinds of different programs. And that was so important to me because I knew he understood how that industry worked. And I talked to him and he said, no, an agent's useless. Said, really? Then what do I do? And he said, actually, you should go through the production companies because the production companies are the ones who have connections to say Travel Channel or Netflix. And I was surprised by that. So Jordan, how can you figure out, is it the norm for someone in your field, animation and concept art to have an artist? How do you figure that out? To have an art, you mean to have an agent? Yeah, because it's not always clear. I mean, we have this chart here. Mm -hmm. Basically, if you want to be a fine artist and show in a white cube gallery, you don't need one. But in illustration, it is the norm. It is common. You know, it, it really depends. Um, there are there are a lot of people I know who work in the animation and games industry who don't have an agent and don't even plan on it or haven't really considered it. Uh, but I think it's really good to have that if you are starting out uh, or if you don't really know how to negotiate well and if you or maybe you get nervous in certain situations like their their whole incentive is to find you work and they make money when you make money so they have a very solid reason for them to be able to get you solid solid work and um and get you in the door ginger's asking how many artists have agents like is it a common thing what do you think kat I can't give a number to that because I don't know all the artists in the world, but it really depends on the field you're in. For instance, there's a really great comment here by Emmy Pax that says, I'm agented, but it's for writing. It's hard to navigate the publishing world without one. And most publishers can't even be approached without them. So it really depends on your field, as everybody has said before. So in the publishing field, I think it's kind of necessary because those big five publishers they won't talk to some artist who's just going to message them unless you have a very personal connection with them. You need an agent to really put your foot in the to put your foot into the door. Ripple of Aqua is asking, also, I just don't know when in an art career is a good time to look for an agent. You read our minds, <laughs> Ripple of Aqua, because this is the next slide, which is saying when you're just getting started. You don't necessarily need one. In fact, it might even be premature. What's your take, Jordan? Yeah, I don't. Th I don't think it's a hundred percent necessary to have one at the beginning. I think it depends on the individual because, like, let's say that you're a type of person who uh, doesn't really fight for your worth as an artist in terms of uh, salary or income. Then it, it, you might want to have an agent because they'll fight for you. Uh, at least a good one. But uh, if you can find it find and get the connections yourself or if they're these studios are reaching out to you then you know maybe you can wait a little bit um it, it really depends on every individual situation for example cat you have a current book deal if you did not have a book deal i'm not so sure an agent would be necessary in the moment i mean was that one of the reasons you decide to get an agent because you do have a book deal I think I went about it out of order because I wish I had had my agent before I got my book deal. So the way I got my book deal was I was really keen on representing myself and contacting these publishers because I didn't really know what else to do. And once I got my book deal, I learned later, oh, an agent is supposed to protect you in these situations where you're negotiating your contract, etc. Additionally, an agent could have marketed my book, my book pitch to different companies that I didn't have connections to. So I wish I had had my agent before getting my book deal, but it's okay. When I got my book deal, I became more desirable in the eyes of agents. So I was able to net an agent ease more easily because I already had my book deal. So it really depends on the situation. And by the way, you don't just get an agent. There are a lot of agents as a whole submission process and they have to accept you. Maybe there are some agents that just boom, you can get them, but I don't know that that's a good sign, Jordan. Uh, yeah, like my situation was a little different because it came through uh, personal relationships and networking. But uh, yeah, I, I think you, you're really going to have to want to do your research on who these people are, um, what sort of projects have they represented, um, and what kind of clients they represent. Um, all those things are incredibly important because as 
was mentioned before, if you're trying to build a personal business and business relationship with them, you have to be able to trust them and you have to know that they're going to have your back. Sarah's asking, what do contracts generally look like? Anything. There are com contracts that are 15 pages long. There are some that are one page long. And I have had Greg Kanan look at many of my contracts. For example, when I was looking at those production companies, I stumbled upon one that let you pitch a show to them, but they wanted you to sign a form before you submitted it to them. And so I called Greg and I said, is that normal? And he said, yes, I would be worried about the production company if they didn't have you sign something before pitching the show. I would never have known that by myself. And I think the most important thing, the times when it's important for me to hire a lawyer is when it's a contract for something that's sort of a big deal. Jordan, you have worked for big companies. You had a gig with Netflix. That's not a time to say, I can figure this out on my own. <laughs> yeah, no, uh, when, it was, when it came to Netflix, actually, um, my agent had already seen the contract beforehand. She's like, it's good to go. Just, <laughs> just if you want the job, you take it. <laughs> um, but you know, there are times, um, I actually remember having a class where they, uh, where their the teacher was trying to tell us about contracts and he's like, sign it. And all the students signed it and we totally messed up. Cause when we read it, it was basically like giving all your rights away. Now this was a mock scenario, but it was like, you don't have any rights to reproduce this work on your own. You don't, you can't put it in your portfolio. You can't you know, put your name on it. Like it was just terrible. So, and, and because they use certain jargon, a lot of us don't really know what that means. <laughs> so yeah, you have to be incredibly careful if you're trying to read through these things yourself. Amanda says, how come there aren't agents for fine art? Well, Anna <laughs> did the work for us and answered the question. I'm pretty sure agents in the contemporary art world exist. Galleries and curators, yes. Agents, no. I think it's more of a literary world thing. Yes. They exist in fine art, but you really don't need them. In the contemporary art world, it is much more important that you form relationships with curators with art dealers, gallery directors, they're the ones who are in a position to give you a show. And you just don't need an agent to negotiate that with you. Thank you so much, Sentine Charcoal, for the super sticker. Keep those coming, everybody. They do add up over time. We greatly appreciate your support. The next thing is if you decide, okay, I do need an agent, you got to research them. So one thing you can do is ask other artists about their agent. Kat, I know somebody recently reached out to you. Right. Somebody did reach out to me about not my agent, but the agency my agent is part of. And I'm going to have a call with them pretty soon. <laughs> and another thing you got to keep an eye out for, does your art actually match the type of art that that agent represents because usually you can go to say the agency website and you can look at all the artists that they represent and you can have very different work within the same field i mean jordan i'd imagine for you somebody an agency that has really high-end industry 3d animation that's not really a good fit for what you do yeah you definitely need to know what industry you're going to be a part of and what agency i'm sorry what, what industry your agent represents um if i'm trying to do games and animation but the agent is all about children's book then that might not be a good fit so you have to be able to understand that going in and it's not about uh it's not meant to be a selfish thing it's not meant to be like oh this isn't you know this is unfair or whatever it's just not a good fit. That's really all it's about. And you have to, as we talked about on the stream, you have to find an agent that actually works for you and is going to advance your career and, and help you get to your goals. I had to do the same thing when I was talking to Greg Kanan. I had to be really clear. Listen, I want a show for a streaming service because when I was looking just on my own online, a lot of the stuff, if you look up film agent, is actually documentary filmmakers who have already made the film and they want to shop it around to various streaming services. I am not a documentary filmmaker. I mean, yeah, what I do is nonfiction, but the thing is 
those are not the agents who are going to help me out. It's a whole other group of people that do documentaries versus something like what I want to do, which is a travel art show. You want to make sure it's that field, not an adjacent one. Kat, there are literary agents who only represent writers, but you're a little different. You're writing and illustration, and then there's agents who only do illustration. <laughs> right. When I was picking my agent, I was very careful to pick someone who did do comics or did do picture and word. I didn't want somebody who just did writing. And if you research a little deeper on different kinds of agents, some agents say, I'm not comfortable re uh, representing fiction. I'm like, great, so everything I do is fiction. <laughs> so I better not go with that agent. So you better get an agent who is in your specific field, but also has the themes in your work and the topics you talk about in mind as well. They should specialize in those themes. Yeah, and also the types of stories. Kat, your story is so rich and metaphorical you don't want to get somebody who represents stuff like Captain Underpants. Like that's a, such a different type of story. And sure, there's room for variation. I'm not saying there isn't, but that is important to really look at those artists and see what they actually represent. Sentient says an agent's work seems like the opposite of what a lot of us arty types enjoy. Reading contracts, negotiation, dealing with people all the time. Jordan, was it a relief to have an agent who would do that stuff for you? Yes. Actually, one of my biggest struggles is the business side of things because, um, first of all, I don't understand a lot of the jargon that they use. Um, I, you know, lacking in experience because my age and just time in the field and everything. And so it's really nice to have an expert just say, yeah, this is a good one. Sign this. Because, again, they have a vested interest in you reaching your goal because they don't get paid until you get paid. And so, you know, if they're, if they're trying, they're not going to be able to cheat you at, as anything when it comes to that situation. Emmy Pack says some of the clauses you'll want to read carefully are sections covering things like royalty rates, right of first refusal, payout structure, and also non-compete clauses. You want to argue those down as narrowly as possible. Kat, some of the stuff we don't even know about I mean, a lot of times they write something in the contract and i go oh what's that i, I had no idea that was even a thing <laughs> <laughs> yeah when i first got my book deal the way i researched what was right in a contract was just contacting as many artists as possible who i knew were published and saying these were what were stated in the contract is that fair and some of them were like oh that's not fair or you should argue a little bit more for this, but overall it seems pretty good. And I said, okay, the general majority says it's okay. But the problem is that we're all artists and we're not agents and editors. We're not part of that world. And so when I got my agent and she looked at the contract, she said, it's mostly fair, but there's this one thing that's not industry standard. And we would have never known that because we're not part of that industry. Sarah says, does one hire an agent for a specific project or for you? Generally, I'm a little confused. Jordan, how does it work with your agent? Do you wait until you have a project or is it just blanket, you're my agent? Uh, it's a blanket thing, at least for me in my situation. It's a blanket thing. Like she goes to look for work for me in different studios. Um, but if I do have a project, then I can give it to her and say, hey, I want to shop this around. And we sort of got into this conversation a little bit earlier where if you have a project, like how do you get it out? Because a lot of studios won't even let you walk in the door without an agent and so that's a really good time to have one as well so that they can represent you and say hey we have this great project for this company networking and personal connections this is actually more common that people will find an agent this way which i know is frustrating because a lot of us say oh my gosh i don't have any personal connections but they don't always come from other artists. Kat, how did you get your agent? <laughs> a very complicated journey. So I had a friend, a personal friend, who's a Fulbright scholar and went to Taiwan. And in Taiwan, she met the husband of another agent. <laughs> and I managed to get a call with this agent. And my work wasn't really a good fit for her, but that was totally fine. It was very pleasant. But she introduced me to two other agents. 
And out of those two agents, one of them became my official agent. Agents have agent friends. And so you might like Kat meet an agent who let's say represents actors. Like I actually asked Deep D when I was thinking I needed an agent, hey, I'm not gonna act. I'm not gonna be on law and order like you were, but maybe your agents have an agent friend. The whole point is that you can't write off anything and you can't have tunnel vision because Jordan, I know a lot of your contacts have not been from other artists. Uh, yeah, that's true. I mean, sometimes uh, it, sometimes things just happen <laughs> randomly. You just see people like I've um, like I went to school with some people who introduced me to others. It's just it's really interesting. I mean, I, the way I got my agent though, it was through a foreign professor of mine. Um, so there's there's that. It just I couldn't have predicted that 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 was going to happen. It just it is what it is, and you just kind of take the opportunities as they come. But if you want to find an agent without a personal or a networking connection, that's totally possible too. So what you have to do first is research the agencies and agents out there who you would like to represent your work and then see if their query options are open. So basically that is a list of things that agents are looking for. They are looking to represent artists. Are they even open to accepting new clients? And then you have to write a query letter. So find their contact information. Usually it's also listed with their query lists and say, this is who I am, this is my work, and I would like you to represent me if that's possible. And wait and see if they reply. I've actually had friends who got agents that way. Amanda's asking, what if there's no agent in your region? Doesn't matter. Kat, I don't think your agent lives where you live. It depends on what you mean by a region, like geographical region, or do you mean a part of the art world that you don't see represented through an agent? like a metaphorical region. <laughs> I kind of read like, it. Is that... you know, access. That's kind of what I saw it as. Access? <laughs> yeah. Perhaps. <laughs> but, you know, if you don't really find agents in this section you are looking for, maybe there's a reason why, such as what Clara said about she doesn't need an agent after all to pitch a Netflix travel show. <laughs> Emmy says, got my literary agent through cold queries and I come from the boonies. Don't even worry about that. A long time ago in the 80s, you had to go to New York if you wanted to be an illustrator. Now, if you have a good internet connection in Antarctica, you're fine. So don't worry <laughs> about where you live. And those cold calls work. A lot of us have gotten jobs through cold calls. I emailed the Dean at RISD when I was first getting started teaching and I just said, hi, I'm available. I'm interested. I didn't get anything right away, but a year later I got a call for an interview. So you're planting a little seed. That's why patience is so important. You can't expect instantaneous results. Like don't get upset if you apply to three agents and none of them accept you. That's extremely common. Never work with an agent that asks for a fee up front. Why is that, Jordan? Well, the again, they should not get paid until you get paid. And so if you're putting up your money up front, then they're basically getting they're, they have a potential of getting away with your your money and you have no proof that they're even a good fit for you. And so it sort of has to be this relationship like, hey, you scratch my back, I scratch yours. That's how it's supposed to work. Um, and so, yeah, you don't want to get scammed out there because there are some people who are just money hungry and they don't care about the clients that they're um, that they're getting. And I'm sorry to say, but a lot of artists fall for it simply because they just don't know. It's not because you're a bad artist. It's just it's hard to have any savvy about this. And that's why talking to other artists, listening to us, all of those things really matter. Because, Kat, I know some artists feel shame that they don't understand this stuff but no way none of us understand this stuff yeah you're an expert in your field let someone else be an expert in their field it's fine if you don't understand each other's fields to the degree of an expert <laughs> here's a good comment from emmy emmy i feel like you should be running this stream <laughs> emmy says artists agents rep you for life or ideally they rep you for life things happen now jordan let's say you have an agent and 
nothing's really happening and they're a little flaky. What do you do? Uh, well, actually, so in my situation, I signed a contract with my agent for two years. Um, so if after two years, we both decide that there's, there's, it's not a good fit, then we have the freedom to go our separate ways. Uh, but ideally, if they are, you know, if everything is working very well, like a well oiled machine, then you can always resign that. So I don't know of any agency that would be like, you're stuck with me for 50 years or something. Like, I've never heard that before. Um, I would not sign a contract that said that. that, that, that you for that's intense. <laughs> nope, that's a bad deal to me. 50, 50 years, that's like marriage. <laughs> <laughs> and Kat, it's okay to switch agents. I know artists have done that. Oh yeah, for sure. People evolve, their needs change. And sometimes you just need to find the right agent that suits those needs. Sometimes the answer is you need to find another agent. Thank you so much, Amanda, for the super sticker. We so much appreciate your... <laughs> Keep those super stickers coming. If it's a dollar, if it's $30, they add up and they really make a difference for us. At Art Prof, $50, is impactful. I know it doesn't sound like a lot, but for us, it really makes a difference. So thank you all for that support. And by the way, we do have a stream about art scams. This would be important because all of this stuff about things to watch out for, this will help protect you at least at the initial entry point. So you know, okay, I don't even have to bother with that option. Some agents are amazing are useless and this is where you can say no jordan if you at the end of the two years realize i don't really like this agent people worry oh am i going to hurt their feelings but they worked with me for two years do we care about that that's that's always the tricky thing artists especially artists have a hard time i think dealing with i don't want to hurt their feelings but it's a business relationship you know if it's not working for you then it's not working for you and you should have the freedom to walk away if that's the case. Um, but on the flip side, if you have an agent who's constantly finding you work and at, you know every other month they're like, hey, I got you this gig and you're constantly getting higher uh, pay at each gig, then why would you want to get rid of them? So th there's, there's that balance. And then there's personality types. Sometimes maybe you just don't fit with them on, on that level. Um, so yeah, everything, everything counts. But um, yeah, some are great, some are not so great. This is a very important question. Do you like your agent as a person? Some people don't think this matters. They say, oh, this person has high standards and they're high up on the food chain in the industry, therefore they must be good. But if you don't get along with them as a person, that can be awful. Kat, I know you thought about that quite a bit when you were looking for an agent and you were actually fielding offers from two agents which actually was helpful as far as seeing the differences. Right. Uh, the problem I had was that I really liked both agents and I really love them as people too. I would want to be friends with both of them, but unfortunately I could only choose one. But I had a friend who fielded one agent who was a pretty established figure in the industry and had represent was currently representing pretty good authors and uh, artists who were publishing constantly. But the problem was that after signing with the agent, they realized that agent was not personally invested in them. They would ghost them on emails. They would not reply on time. They would not have very detailed conversations with them. And my friend said, this, I don't really like this person because it doesn't seem like they like me. How are they going to represent me well enough? So they ended up having to cut that contract. This is important across the board in every field, in every single interaction. I think it was Lauren who said to somebody, you got to be on Clara's good side if you want to work on our prof. It's true. <laughs> if I don't like you, goodbye. <laughs> I don't care if you're the most incredibly skilled artist and you're showing at some shishi gallery in New York. I don't care if I don't like you as a person. That is not a good relationship because Jordan... This is a serious business partnership. Mm -hmm. And it, I guess we're saying it's like marriage. <laughs> Some of the previous comments, 
this is not a little, hey, I talk to you once in a while thing. They have to be psyched about what you're doing. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to end up in a relationship, a business relationship with someone who you don't, you don't like. I mean, you, hopefully you wouldn't get married to someone you didn't like. Um, it's the same kind of situation, right? You have to be able to trust that person to get you work, to be able to represent you well, be able to get you paid and get your lights uh, turned on and everything and continue to do that. Not just a one time thing. Like if they find you one job and then after six months, they don't get you anything else, then that is also a problem. So you have to be able to like really test that out and use your better judgment. This sounds a little melodramatic, but some of this stuff can get emotional and it can be taxing on you because oftentimes the situations where we do need an agent are very important to us. If I ever get my travel art show going, that's going to be an emotional roller coaster. Like I was talking to Greg Kanan, who did all the legal work for Art Prof. I mean, I felt like half of it was him reassuring me. It's okay. <laughs> breathe. I mean, I felt like an idiot because I was like, I don't think you signed on for this. He's like, nah, nah, everybody does that. <laughs> <laughs> and so Kat, I think that's something to consider because your book is very important to you. This is not just, oh yeah, I cleaned my bathroom today. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I want somebody to be as enthusiastic about my work as almost me because <laughs> Why would I want to work with somebody who is just like really meh about a project that I invested so much of my emotional and mental and time capacity in? I want somebody to recognize that. And I want somebody to represent me who's a fan of my work. <laughs> Jordan, you have shadow boxers that you would like to get on Netflix or a service at that, some point, And you're deeply invested. I mean, did you start shadow boxers when you were a kid? I don't even think you were 20. No, I wasn't 20. Yet. I was, I mean, it didn't have the name shadow boxers, but I was a teenager. Yeah. And it's been something that I've been developing more intensely over the last three or four years. And uh, yeah, like my agent would be a perfect person to give that to so they can walk it into a Nickelodeon or Netflix or whatever to see if it can become something. Um, and that, again, that's that would be very hard to do by myself to just walk in and be like, hi, everyone, I have a show that's going to get you millions of dollars and no one's representing me at all. Like that would just be <laughs> very unprofessional and unlikely to happen. They advocate for you. And that's huge because as an artist, we oftentimes do feel very alone. Oh, I'm the only person working on this. And that is the case for a lot of early projects. Jordan, I don't think you have a crew of 50 people working with you on shadow boxers yet. No, <laughs> I do not. <laughs> Emmy says agents are often the barrier between you and the publisher corporation can play bad cop for you when things go wrong. A lot of artists are very uncomfortable saying no or putting their foot down. And Kat, I imagine that is really nice to know that they can come and be like, nope. Because a lot of people say, oh, if I say no to the editor, they're not going to like me anymore. Yeah, it takes the pressure off of you. But also there are social interactions with these business related things. Like, for instance, my agent said, well, we can't exactly say no to this, but we can have a comparison going like, oh, you give a better thing to this person or this work, then why not for this? So it's not necessarily a no but negotiation here is key. And so those social interactions are really important. And sometimes you just don't know, like in the moment, maybe you're emotional and you're like, this is unfair, but you can't say that, right? Your agent can help you navigate the situation. Now, if I ever get my travel art show on Netflix, let's say I'm on the cusp and oh my gosh, it's gonna happen, but we just need to do this one little thing. I would be freaking out and there's no chance I could even think about that objectively because Jordan, if you're in the situation, you're so close to shadow boxes. It's just a couple more steps. Yeah. You're probably going to be freaking out too. Yeah. I've heard some stories where people are so close and then just get snatched away from them. It's like, just like that. Um, but then there are times where, um, so, so my agency, they are the same agency that represented Phineas and Ferb and that show took like 15 years to get on. And 
you know, there's there's patience that comes with it, um, and a lot of tenacity and a lot of grit. Like you have to really want this as a, a as a career path or as a goal for you. Ginger says, having an agent just sounds like you are famous. You don't have to be an established artist to have an agent. And it doesn't mean you're a good artist either. You can be a really bad artist. And if that agent is willing to take you on, it doesn't really matter. I mean, you do have to have something to show them. You can't get an agent and just say, well, I will have a portfolio eventually. And you do have to prove yourself to them. But... Kat, you don't need a Guggenheim to get an agent. You don't have a Guggenheim grant. <laughs> <laughs> no, but I have a lot of artists who weren't published yet, who didn't have any major breakthroughs in their careers, who still got agents because they represent, they had a body of work to prove that, yes, I have potential. You should represent me because I have this potential. Rosalie says, I guess it's not exactly an agent I need, but as a disabled neurodivergent artist, I feel like I need someone to represent and help me with all the very overwhelming parts of going pro. The agents can really fill in the blanks for a lot of parts. Let's say you have severe social anxiety and, and you feel so awful being on a group call with multiple people. That's also important, Jordan. Yeah. The, the way maybe maybe this would help think of an agent like a bodyguard you know like <laughs> like if you're if you're walking and suddenly there's stuff flying at you your agent's like nope got you and they put up a shield and they block you from all that stuff you know doesn't like, mean that you're not going to experience some sort of adversity or you're not going to come across a very bad contract but the goal of that agent is to protect you so if like Clara said if you're in that situation where you're nervous about whatever their goal is to help you. So maybe, maybe that helps, hopefully. <laughs> Talking about bodyguards and marriage stuff reminds me of the bodyguard film that Whitney Houston was in. <laughs> I don't know. I feel like I could use a bodyguard for life if that's what they actually do for you. <laughs> and we also have a super sticker from Lydia. Thank you. Thank you, Lydia. All right, everybody, I hope you will join us in the Art Prof Discord because we are going to be doing a stage session. A stage session is where you get to go on voice to ask us questions. All three of us will be in post live stream stage in the Discord. And so we hope you will join us for that stage session. We talk about everything. It doesn't necessarily have to be related to this stream. There are many ways to support Art Prof because we need you. Make a one-time donation on PayPal. $5 makes a difference. If five of you do that, that's $25. You can buy Art Prof merch. You can also purchase an artist call. So often we have tons of content, but people are in such specific situations that sometimes the content we have is not sufficient enough. It's not customized for their particular situation. So this is a great call to get information about whatever we can do to support you. Thank you to our top patron supporters. I'm so excited. We have two new supporters. We have Johanna Miklos and Renee Morales. Thank you both for joining and getting all those perks. It's really nice because I am not present in the public channels in the Discord very often. And if you wanna really interact with me, you need to join the Patreon channels because I'm just spread too thin otherwise. And I'm sad this week. We lost $52 in Patreon. We still have what we need, but oh man, I wanna sleep at night and 6,000 would definitely do it. So consider that you get email newsletters, perks, all kinds of fun things. Art Prof has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And remember, subscribe to our channel for more tutorials, critiques, and business tips. Everyone, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.